Blog Talk Radio. Welcome, world. Welcome once again to Tuesday Talk with Key West Lou. I am your host, Louis Patron. Well, the weeks continue to be interesting. They continue to be exciting. Uh, they continue to give me a feeling of desperation sometimes because I don't know what the hell's going to happen in this world we're living in. I'm talking specifically about our president and our country and what the hell he's doing all over the world. Uh, we are a divided nation in more than one way. Uh, I'm going to open the show tonight with some examples of that, uh, evidencing a division, uh, though not subtle, most people aren't aware of. It goes too deep. The division goes too deep. I'm going to talk about guns, okay, the guns, because we've had the shooting, what, 10 days ago, two weeks ago? What's happening? A big zero, nothing, and I'm afraid that's going to continue that way. I have some things to say about that. And then I'm going to get into this tariff thing that the president called for, and he seems he's serious about it. Uh, and that's going to create a lot of havoc, and I have some thoughts on that I want to share with you. So let's start. First thing I want to talk about tonight is the Delta Airlines uh, NRA thing, as you recall. Uh, oh, I would say about 10 days ago, uh, Delta Airlines announced as one of the American companies uh, that had been giving discounts or had different certain financial arrangements with the NRA that they were no longer going to provide a discount to NRA members for any flights made on Delta. Uh, and uh, so be it. That's Delta's right to do that. Well, the state of Georgia thought they had some rights here. And what the state of Georgia did was the legislature passed a bill, which the governor, uh, who doesn't seem to have a strong spine, signed into law immediately. And they, t because Delta took the discount away from the NRA members, the state of Georgia took a $50 million a year gas jet fuel discount away from Delta. In other words, Delta was going to have to pay now six, $50 million a year more from this point forward for jet fuel because they took this uh, discount away from NRA members if they flew Delta. Now, the, 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 the stupidity of this whole thing, no one takes the time to look into anything. Do you know how many people utilize this discount program? How many NRA people utilize the discount program? Uh, with Delta, a grand total of 13, you heard me, 13 people got discounts because they flew with Delta who were NRA members. But Georgia, to punish Delta, says, screw you, we're taking away that $50 million discount we give you every year on the jet fuel you buy. Now, you have to remember, Delta Airlines is one of the largest employers in the state of Georgia. Atlanta is the national hub for Delta Airlines. We all know. We go through Atlanta. It's so busy. It's amazing. Absolutely amazing. And uh, so they did this stupid thing. Now, they did this. The state of Georgia did this. Understand what the legislature's thinking was, and I'm using their verbiage. They removed the removal of the discount is a punishment for people who cherish the Second Amendment. That's right. The legislature said in passing a law to take this $50 million a year discount to one of their largest employers that it's a punishment to you, Delta, for the people that you're screwing, in effect, by taking that discount away who cherish the Second Amendment. Well, I got to tell you something. I admire the CEO of uh, Delta, Ed Bastian's his name, Ed Bastian. He said, and I quote, our values are not for sale. Our values are not for sale. Now, let me tell you what I would do if I were Delta Airlines. Uh, I mean, let's stop screwing around. You're going to beat the shit out of me for $50 million. I'm going to beat the crap right back out of you. I would start taking away some small jobs that you have located in the Atlanta area and move them somewhere else. So the people 
people of Georgia know that because of the stupidity of their state legislature, uh, Delta's thinking of moving. And then I would spread the word that Delta is having talks with various other major cities, and it's easily done. Uh, you can enter into some conversations about moving their entire operation. And then see what happens in the state of Georgia with these legislators. Uh, I've never heard of anything so stupid in my life. Uh, it's a punishment we're imposing on you. This is punishment by a state legislature on a big business employing thousands of people. I was not aware, I was not aware that it was the purpose of government to punish in situations of this nature. Now I want to stay with this thing where this shows you the division where a state legislature would do this to a major employer in their state. Uh, let's talk about the city of Oakland. Oakland is a sanctuary city. Uh, and there are many of the larger cities in this country are sanctuary cities. They will not support the efforts of the federal government to corral and deport, corral and deport, take into custody and deport people who have been here illegally for years, some 20, 30 years. Uh, they've married here. They have families. They work. Some have, act, have fought in the, the military, male and female alike. But because they are not citizens and somehow they're not here properly, uh, Trump said, we're going to get rid of these people here illegally. And a lot of the cities in this country are standing up and say, you're not coming into my city and doing that. We will not support your efforts, federal government. Well, Oakland's one of those sanctuary cities. The mayor is Libby Schatt, Libby Schatt. And they had to give her a medal, <laughs> a big medal. Here's what happened last week. ICE, I-C-E, the federal agency that comes in in the middle of the night, knocks on people's doors, breaks them down, goes in, takes illegals out, picks them up on the street. You ain't got any papers, and they take them away. Uh, and within 24 hours, these people are deported. They don't even appear before a judge. There's no judicial system to protect them normally. ICE was going to make a raid in the Oakland area to pick up 1,000 illegals in one night. 1,000 illegals. Well, Mayor Schaaf, Libby, she found out about this, not through legal channels, but the word got out that this was going to happen, and she got it informally through friends and things like that, nothing nothing uh, public. And she says, I can't do this. So she went on TV, she went on the radio, she issued news releases immediately and said, they're coming for you tonight, 1,000 of you, beware, hide, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And when ICE went in the next day to make these 1,000 arrests, you know how many they got? 150 people. <laughs> 850 didn't get caught at all, and it was because of Mayor Libby Schaaf. Uh, well, <laughs> they're not happy with her, the federal government. She says, and I quote, What I did was my job as the mayor of Oakland and reflective of the values of the people that I represent. And she said, because the federal government, the, the heads of the various agencies involved, said she should be arrested. And they made it sound like they were going to arrest her, but nothing has happened yet. She said, I'm willing to go to jail for this. This woman's never going to be defeated in an election again. Uh, now, Trump's wrong with his deportation program. You just This is the United States of America. We don't do things this way. They're here illegally. Then you get rid of them legally, not illegally. Just because you say, I signed a piece of paper and this group's got to go, that's not legal to me. If you're going to take them, take them into custody, have a, spe have a special court system set up where you're supposed to have one for these people to be brought before, have lawyers appointed for them. You've got to do the whole routine. Due process applies to everyone in this country, whether you're a citizen or not. Let's not break our basic tenets of uh, of law, our basic rules of faith in our country by doing things like this. Let me say quickly also that I compare that raid, Oakland, where they were seeking to pick up a thousand people that night, comparable to what happened in Nazi Germany, yes, in Nazi Germany in the 1930s when the Gestapo or the German police went out and made roundups of the Jewish people. 
Now, we shouldn't be having fights like this. Sanctuary cities, federal government taking in all these people. We shouldn't have uh, a state legislature punishing a major uh, a major employer in their state. These these are crazy things. We've never had crap like this before. And I want to stay with this for a moment more. I want to go to Secretary of the Treasury Steve Munchen. Have you ever seen him? He looks like a creep. He sounds like a creep. I think he is a creep. And I don't think it's wrong for me to label him that way. He's a creep. That's all I can tell you. He's a former Goldman Sachs banker. Let me tell you what this guy's background is, and then you will agree with me. He was in charge of the mortgage foreclosures for Goldman Sachs. Remember 2008? Millions of people in this country lost their homes, okay, millions. And he, Goldman Sachs, Goldman Sachs, was one of the banks that had a lot of the mortgage paper. He was responsible. He was responsible. He headed the, he headed the team for foreclosures on 36 million people. Did you hear me what I said? 36 million people lost their homes because this guy ran the shop that did the work for Goldman Sachs, all right? And <laughs> terrible. And he was the guy who created the tax law that Congress finally passed, the new tax law that saves people so much money. It's only saving the very rich money, not the, the, the middle class, but what's left of it and the poor people in this country. That was his headache. That was his responsibility. That was his ball game. He was all over the country with and without Trump pushing it. Well, he went to UCLA last week. Uh, he went to speak. He had never spoke before a college group before. And he had an experience because these young kids are like the high school kids uh, at Douglas High School in Florida where 17 were killed. Uh, they're not going to take crap anymore. The kids are upset, and this includes college people, and I call them kids. They're, what, 18, 19, 20? They're very, very young people. They're millennials. They're the end of the millennials. And when you combine these millennials and these high school students, beware. That's all I can say. Beware. They're going to come because they're not going to tolerate bullshit from anybody. They're going to call things the way they are, and they, they're going to insist on changes, and they're going to get changes. Well, these kids are listening to him, and all of a sudden one kid yells out, I think you're full of shit. And then somebody else picks up, I think you're full of shit. And eventually everybody's yelling at him, I think you're full of shit. Uh, and they also verbally got up and in the middle of his speech, showing no respect. But this is a man that may not be entitled to respect. Let me say that. Uh, they denounced the ta Republican tax bill as an attack on, and I quote, people who are in poverty. Well, he was very upset. And he insisted that they identify themselves before they spoke. No problem. They said, I'm Tom Jones. And he also insisted that they explain to him why they were protesting in this fashion. UCLA had asked his permission to video the, uh, his speech and then show it on their television network afterwards. He gave that permission. After, the, after his speech, he withdrew the permission. He told him, you can't show this. I don't want it seen. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about this guy. Uh, let me say this, too. Uh, he is the man who claims we're going to have 3% growth in this country every year. Well, let me tell you, 3% growth is a hell of a lot of growth. Uh, 2.4, yeah, 2.53 is like, you know, winning the lottery. <laughs> So they questioned him, and they wanted to know how he was getting the 3%. He couldn't tell them. And these kids don't take shit. They wanted to know, how are you getting the 3%? It's mathematical. What's your plan? So he accused them from his podium of being biased. Their, their questions, questioning him how he's going to get the 3% showed bias. And he, the only way he could respond was, and I quote, we fundamentally believe that we will have economic growth. That's all. He couldn't tell them why they were going to have economic growth. We fundamentally believe we are going to have economic growth. Let me tell you about this guy. If you recall, 
he got married uh, since he became secretary last summer sometime. Last summer in the early fall, he got married. And he took a trip to several different countries in the world with his bride. He was on his honeymoon. And he used a United States Air Force jet plane, a special plane for dignitaries, to take him and his wife everywhere, okay? And, and this plane, he had nothing to do, no official business. They were on their, their honeymoon. cost $25,000 an hour to operate. It, was, it, it came to around a million dollars, the use of the plane, for his honeymoon with his wife. And when he was asked to justify it, it, justify it, he said, I am Secretary of the Treasury, and I need to be secure. We were concerned for my safety, and therefore we used the military jet. He never paid back a penny. No one's forcing him to pay back a penny. The president isn't going to ask him to pay back a penny of that cost. It came out of your taxpayer dollars and my tax dollars. Dollars. I want to talk now about O'Hare Airport in Chicago, O'Hare Airport in Chicago, for three reasons. Number one, it was announced yesterday that the USS Lexington, a World War II naval carrier, uh, which sunk, <laughs> we sunk it. It was one of the battles off the coast of Australia, several hundred miles off the coast, north coast of Australia. Uh, the ship lost, I don't know how many hundreds uh, of its personnel, but two, about 2,500 more were saved, and then we scuttled the boat. We, we, we sunk our own carrier so the Japanese would not get it. It was going to go down at some point, but we got rid of it right away. It's never been found since 1943 or 1944 when this occurred. It was announced yesterday it was found by a group that's been looking for it. 1.8 miles below sea level, almost two miles below sea level, they finally found it. The pictures that were taken look like the pictures of the Titanic when the Titanic was discovered underwater. Now, here's the significance in, with O'Hara Airport. In 1942, one of the pilots, Navy pilots on the Lexington, was Lieutenant Edward Butch O'Hare, of Chicago. This was the beginning of World War II that spring of 1942. We didn't have enough planes. We didn't have enough pilots. It was announced that nine Japanese bombers, nine Japanese bombers were approaching the Lexington and they were going to bomb the Lexington and try to sink it. A handful of American pilots, including Lieutenant O'Hare, took off from the Lexington to meet the enemy. O'Hare, four minutes. Hear what I'm saying? In four minutes, this man shot down five of the bombers. Shot down five of the bombers in four minutes. He, received, he immediately became an ace because if you shoot down five enemy planes, you were considered an ace. He was the first ace in World War II, and he received for his efforts the Congressional Medal of Honor. O'Hare Airport, he was later killed in 1943, O'Hare Airport is named after Lieutenant Edward Butch O'Hare. All right, that's the other significant part. Now, there's a third part to this story, and he flew off to Lexington, that's the tie-in there. It has been announced this past week that O'Hare Airport, the city of Chicago owns O'Hare Airport, they're going to do an $8.5 billion expansion over a period of eight years, $8.5 billion over eight years. They're going to expand and renovate and reconstruct the airport big time. It's going to be the state of the art as regards a global international terminal. It's going to increase the size of O'Hare Airport by 75%, by 3 million square feet. There will be a dozen, dozens of new gates and seven additional concourses. And they're going to pay for it. And this is why I'm telling you this part of the story without taxpayer dollars. Here's how it works. I didn't know this, and most of you may not know it. And that's why I'm sharing it with you. Uh, what happens is this 35 years ago, uh, the city of Chicago owns O'Hare Airport. They ha entered into a, an agreement with meant all the airlines using the terminal at the time, 35 years ago. And it determined the fees by which 
payment was to be made for use of the airport to the city, and any additional airlines that came in to use the airport were bound by this agreement. There were increments built in and everything else. Well, this 35-year agreement expires in May. A new one is being negotiated, negotiated. Of course, there will be higher fees. And what the city will do, they will take this contract, take it to the bank. They're going to have a new 35-year contract. And they'll be able to borrow immediately 80% of the money due and owing on that new agreement with the airlines over a period of 35 years immediately. And they will, from those monies, pay off the $8.5 billion worth of construction expansion. Brilliant. Terrific. Did you ever hear of Bump Fargo? I'm going to give you, I want to deviate. Things get a little heavy talking about all this stuff. I want to deviate and talk a wee bit about Key West because that's where I'm sitting when I speak with you every Tuesday night. Bump Fargo, B-U-M-F-A-R-T-O. He was quite a man in the 1970s in Key West. In those days, this was a big drug town. We're not a drug town now. But in those days, the stuff was coming in from the Caribbean, and it was coming over the water and coming into Key West and then being distributed nationally. And you got rich overnight if you were able to assist in some way to bring drugs in and get them into the distribution system. Well, Bump Fardo, that was his nickname. That's not showing disrespect. He was known as Bump. Uh, He was the fire chief. Yeah, Bum was the fire chief, well-respected man in the community. He got involved in the drug trade. He was arrested by the federal government. He was tried and found guilty on drug charges. This happened. He was he was he was found guilty on these drug charges in February 1976. February 1976. Uh, He was not sentenced immediately. They don't sentence immediately. But the day he had to go for sentencing, he left his house, and no one's ever seen Bum Fardo since. No one. His wife reported to the police, my husband disappeared. Now, one of two things happened to Bum. (laughs) Simple. Uh, Either he took off because he wasn't going to go to jail. He would have got 20, 30 years easy, and he's never been found. The more likely scenario uh, the thing most people believed happened is a Jimmy Hoffa that he left his home to go to the court to be sentenced and somehow got sidetracked and disappeared like Jimmy Hoffa did. Remember, his car ended up in the back of a tractor trailer and they believe Jimmy Hoffa's body is somewhere under a new roadbed that was being constructed at the time in New Jersey. Well, we don't know where Bump Fardo is, but I suspect that's the more believable uh, result of his disappearance. Uh, He was going to blow other people in. That's what they thought. He was going to blow other people in looking for a shorter sentence, and as a result, he got done in. I want to talk about the NRA. I want to talk about Donald Trump. Donald Trump, he had the meeting, remember? He he, he brought in uh, parents of those killed. Uh, at, at the Douglas High School and brought him into the White House. They had, a, you know, I, it's the big conference table in the middle. You, and he had the parents. He had some kids. Uh, he had him from the shooting at uh, Sandy Hook several years before, first and second graders. Okay, he had parents of those. And he had senators and Congress people who were interested in helping uh, with new gun legislation. And the president said, We've got to do something. We can't put up with this anymore. Well, he was full of crap then, as he has been on everything he has talked about that way, uh, because nothing's happened since. Uh, and here is what I didn't like about this whole thing. He did not have a representative of the NRA there. At this big meeting, let's have a face-to-face confrontation. No one from the NRA. The next day, that evening, in the White House, There was a meeting between the president and one person, the representative of the NRA, a fellow by the name of Chris Cox, executive director of the NRA's lobbying arm. Uh, He sent out a tweet afterwards, Cox, not the president. The president did, but Cox is I'm going to talk about first. And his tweet said, and I quote, the president, quote, don't want gun control, unquote. Trump's 
tweet said, Ray, the meeting, quote, good, no, great meeting in Oval Office tonight with the NRA. Nothing significant happened. Nothing significant is going to happen. We'll get some legislation. It's going to be bullshit legislation. They're not going to do away with the AR-15s or anything like that. They're not going to do what they should do because they still don't want to offend the NRA. The NRA owns our president. The NRA owns our state legislatures. Uh, The NRA owns our Congress. It's obvious. And yet nothing happens. I want to talk more about these AR-15s. These are weapons of war. They're like machine guns. And I don't know how many seconds, how many rounds go off. I don't know anything about guns, but this is dramatized and written up as a very bad weapon, the AR-15. Well, last week, you're going to love this one. Third graders, third graders in Neosho, N-E-O-S-H-O, Missouri. Neosho, Missouri, seven to nine years old. Uh, they have a baseball team. Their coach is Levi Patterson. And guess what they did? Uh, they're selling an A. They're selling raffle tickets to win an AR-15. This baseball team, these kids, seven to nine, are selling raffle tickets to win an, an AR-15. The coach Patterson, he says, well, we thought of this before before the, the uh, Douglas High School shootings and. It was in works. We thought we shouldn't stop. The father of one of the players is a weapon seller and donated the gun for the raffle. But the coach also said this. He says, you people don't understand. We in Nesho, we in Missouri, we feel differently about guns than people elsewhere. We feel differently about guns. And so we see nothing wrong in the AR-15 being raffled off. Which brings me now to a congressman, a congressional candidate in Kansas. Republican. He's giving away, I got to say, it's true. He's giving away a RAAR 15 rifle. Uh, he's giving one away. You sign up, but you put your name in a box. At some point, they're going to draw a name out, and that person will get, not even, they didn't have to buy a raffle ticket, a free AR 15. Uh, this was all planned and started before. Douglas High School shootings. He refuses to pull back on it. His name is Tyler Tannehill. Tyler Tannehill. He says, I am a passionate defender of gun rights. And he also says, people don't understand how we think here in Kansas about guns. I don't understand how they think about guns. All right, my time is running out. Ho, ho, ho. Uh... Let me hit you with this. Do you know, this is wild, that 3% of the American people, 3% of the American people own more than half the country's guns? 3% of the American people own more than half the country's guns. Uh, That averages to about 17 guns per person. That averages to 133 million people. Not 133 million people, 133 million guns. 3% of the people own 133 million guns. And the reason it's that way is because not everyone in the NRA even owns a gun, but some people buy them because they're waiting for the revolution. They're waiting when the government's going to knock their door down and try to take over the home, their families, rape their wives and their daughters. They're going to be ready to defend their own. And that's why 3% own most of the guns in the country. That's the show for this week. Uh, I hope you enjoyed. I enjoy doing the show. I think it's absolutely terrific. I enjoy your comments I've yet in, in the next few days following. Uh, come back next week and join me again. Ask your friends to join you uh, again because I love doing it and I love sharing these things with you. Thank you again. See you next week. Hi, it's Jamie, progressive number one, number two employee. Leave a message at the... Hey, Jamie. It's me, Jamie. This is your daily pep talk. I know it's been rough going ever since people found out about your acapella group, Mad Harmony, but you will bounce back. I mean, you're the guy always helping people find coverage options with the Name Your Price tool. It should be you giving me the pep talk. Now get out there, hit that high note, and take Mad Harmony all the way to nationals this year! Sorry, it's pitchy. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Price and coverage match limited by state law. (laughs) 
What a matchup. And what a team, Mike. Metro PCS and the iPhone SE for $0 on a network that covers 99% of people in the U.S. Oh, impressive. Play with the best. Switch to Metro PCS and an unlimited LTE plan and get a 32 gig iPhone SE for $0. Metro PCS. Coverage not available in some areas, plus sales tax. Claim based on talk and text. Not valid for active numbers currently on the T Mobile network or active on Metro PCS in the past 90 days. See store for details and terms and conditions.